Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the podium, Bob Deneen. Good morning, everyone. When I saw that uh, commercial the other day, uh, I was moved by it. I was asked a couple nights ago, you know, Bob, you've been doing this for a long time, 26 years. Uh, you get up every morning and you fight the oil companies and you take the slings and arrows for this industry. How do you do it? Why do you do it? And that's my response. Because I am privileged to work for those people. I'm privileged to work for an industry that cares that much, that is as dedicated as farmers are. Um, we have a speaker this morning, the Secretary of Agriculture, who I think understands what this ad is getting at intrinsically, who probably has a passion for farmers and agriculture, and value added agriculture, and ethanol. Uh, that is second to none. When he was governor of Iowa, Tom Vilsack worked to promote value-added agriculture across the state. As the Secretary of Agriculture, he has done so across the entire country, and he has made promoting ethanol specifically uh, one of his top priorities. There's been Secretary Vilsack, who has been the, the strongest voice within the administration, beating back a lot of the nonsense about food versus fuel, trying to educate people about what ethanol and agriculture uh, is really all about. When he was here a year ago, uh, he spoke passionately about uh, these issues to this audience, and I was uh, thrilled when he accepted my invitation to come back again. Please welcome Secretary Tom Vilsen. Good morning uh, to everyone, and Bob, thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction, although I'll tell you, it's uh, pretty doggone tough to follow that ad. Uh, I don't know about all of you, but uh, I'm a Steeler fan, so it's really hard for me to watch the Super Bowl, so I watched it for the ads, and I'm glad I did. Uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful ad, and we're, we're uh, sending a message to the Chrysler Company, thanking them for putting the spotlight on American farmer. Uh, it's well uh, deserved. You know, if you stop and think about the importance of um, the American farmer, or you think of more, more generally the importance of rural America, it is a place that in so many parts of this country is not fully appreciated or recognized. I mean, after all, it is the place where almost all of the food that we consume comes from. 85% of everything that Americans consume is grown and raised here in the United States, and because of that, we are a food secure nation. Uh, unlike virtually any other nation in the world, we have the capacity to produce most, if not all, of what we need to survive. It makes us a stronger nation, it comes from rural America. And then every day we wake up in the morning and we have a cup of coffee or we take a drink of water. We don't really stop to think about where that water comes from or, or who may have worked to make sure that we actually had that water to drink. But when you consider that nearly 80% of the surface water drinking water in this country is impacted and affected by what happens in rural areas, you realize that rural America is responsible for a good part of our water supply. And then if you think about flipping on the lights, getting in your car and driving to work, and you stop and think about where does the energy, where does the fuel, where does the raw materials for us to have this, this business or this home uh, that's well lit or, or well heated, this car that runs, gets me to work. Most of the fuel and energy sources of this country come from rural America. And then, when you pick up the paper, drinking that cup of coffee in that warm office after you've driven your car, brought to you by rural America, you read about brave young men and women who are far, far away from here in places like Afghanistan who are serving their country, putting themselves at risk, and you realize that a significant percentage of those young people, far more than the population of rural America, come from rural America. So rural America is a really important place. 
and it deserves the attention that ad provided. And part of the reason why it does such a great job is because of the people in this room. Because a critical component to the success of rural America is in that renewable fuel and energy industry. You folks are responsible for increasing farm income. In the last couple of years, we've had some of the best farm income we've ever had in the history of the country. You're responsible in part for record years in exports. You're helping to support nearly 380,000 jobs. People who live, work, and raise their families, perhaps in small towns, but also in cities, are beholden to this industry. You've generated over $30 billion of family income. You've helped promote $43 billion in gross domestic product uh, that keeps this country's economy going. You provide that consumer, when they come to the pump, a choice, an opportunity to have less expensive gas. Pick your study, it's somewhere between 25 cents a gallon and maybe as much as $1.39 a gallon that that consumer saves because of the people in this room and the work that you do, and the industry you represent. You're helping us to reduce our reliance on foreign oil. We're now below 50% of the oil that's used in this country being imported. And that's something that people do recognize strengthens us. A recent study from Texas A&M said that nearly 80% of America felt that reducing our reliance on foreign oil was a matter of national security and you're making it happen. And if that weren't enough, because of the innovation and entrepreneurship of the folks in this room, you're constantly looking for ways to do what you do more efficiently, more effectively, and you're producing as a result of that co-products and byproducts that are themselves an industry. Whether it's uh, DDGs or, or, or chemicals that are being uh, produced, this industry is helping to promote entrepreneurship and small business development in America. And I've recently had the opportunity to visit some of these small entrepreneurial companies. An outfit in Pennsylvania that's using water technology to produce uh, through high temperature water an intermediary use uh, a product that's used in ethanol production which will substantially reduce the cost of producing ethanol. Outfit in Wisconsin that's taking the corn cobs and producing plastic bottles. A, uh, a facility in Virginia that's working on taking plant material and producing fiber, uh, fiberglass product that could be used by automobile industry to produce a lighter and stronger auto body which will allow us to meet fuel efficiency standards more easily. That's happening because of this industry. It's amazing. Unfortunately, it's a challenging industry. It's challenged in a lot of different ways. It's challenged by those who perpetuate the false debate that somehow you're asking us in this country of plenty. You're asking us in this country of extraordinary farmers, the most productive farmers in the world. Some folks are suggesting you're asking us to choose between fuel and food. You know that's not true. You know that because American agriculture is the second most productive aspect of our economy since 1980, we've been able to produce enough corn to meet our domestic needs, to continue to export, and also to use it for fuel. You know that a third of what you do and the crops that you use comes back in the form of a feed supplement that is allowing the livestock industry to essentially use less corn for weight gain. You're challenged by some in the environmental community who fail to recognize that this is a product that improves air quality and certainly has reduced the, the significant risk that other additives created to our water system. You're challenged in the regulatory area with folks suggesting that studies done by EPA and the Department of Energy weren't sufficient enough or adequate enough to support the notion that cars in this country could take indeed E15. You're being tested in the courts. You're being tested overseas with trade barriers and restrictions. You're being tested in the halls of Congress. Those who are suggesting that perhaps there 
RFS has outlived its purpose. You have to ask yourself, why all these challenges? Why now? Well, I believe there's a reason. And that reason is that you're winning. I'm sure it doesn't seem like it at times. But you are winning. You're making a difference. You're growing consumer choice. You're growing consumer demand. You're creating new opportunities. And the folks on the other side are a bit concerned that you're winning. So my message to you in part is, you gotta keep pushing on. You gotta keep fighting. Because it's too important not to. Here's what's at stake. The survival of rural America. When the USDA was formed in 1862, nearly 90% of America lived or had contact with rural America. Today, that percentage is 16%. It's the lowest percentage it's been in the history of our country. And as we diminish in the percentage of our population that live in rural America, we obviously see a diminished understanding of what goes on in rural America by those who have to make decisions. The political influence, if you will, of rural America is at risk. Because 84% of the folks in Congress represent the 84% of the folks in this country who live, work, and raise their family, not in small towns, not on farms, not on ranches, but in suburbs and in cities. Your industry has the capacity, is on the leading edge of being able to reverse what we've seen in rural America for far too long, and that is population declines. In this last census, 1,130 rural counties lost population. Only 320 gained population. Your industry and what can happen as a result of your industry can change that. So at stake is the survival of rural America. Also at stake is the capacity of this American economy to do what it's supposed to do, which is to enable people to work hard, play by rules, and to be able to profit and have some degree of social mobility so that they can move up the ladder, if you will, for more opportunities. For far too long, we've had an economy that has everybody sort of locked. It's difficult for the poor to become middle class. It's difficult for the middle class to become upper middle class. Your industry, reviving opportunity in rural areas, creating new opportunities for small business, developing new products, spawning new research, creating more jobs and good paying jobs and more income for our families gives us the capacity to reinvigorate our economy so that it's more socially mobile. So how do you fight that? Let me give you a few suggestions. First of all, let's extend the influence of this group. We, we do a great job in agriculture in rural America talking to ourselves. We have conferences, we meet, we talk to ourselves, we pat each other on the back. We gotta figure out how to talk to a broader audience. Let me give you one example. You have influences you don't even perhaps realize you've got. We have a series of changes taking place in the cabinet. The president in the second term has an opportunity to make some changes. People uh, decide to move on. Secretary Panetta is moving on from the Secretary of Defense position. And Senator Hagel has been nominated as someone to take his place. Now why should that be of the least interest to the renewable fuel folks? outside of the fact that we're all concerned about defending the country? Well, because there's something going on in the Defense Department and the Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis, has started, which is the notion that American military will be stronger and more vibrant if it can depend less on foreign oil for its fuel and more on domestically produced fuel. And so the Secretary of the Navy has set a fairly high goal of 50% of all that they need for their ships and their jets would be furnished through biofuel, domestically produced. Now all of a sudden that Secretary of the Navy has to 
speak to and has to advocate for that product or that program to the Secretary of Defense. And if we have somebody in the Secretary of Defense's office who is an advocate for this new fuel, it will be easier. We had it in Secretary Gates, we had it in Secretary Panetta, and I believe we will have it in Secretary Hegel if he gets confirmed. But we ought to be out there talking to Senator Hegel. We ought to be out there supporting Senator Hegel so that when he gets in that position, he can reinforce and reaffirm what Secretary Mavis is attempting to do, because that will help grow the industry, that will help create more opportunity, that will allow us to create alliances and friendships and connections within the Defense Department, which will make it a little bit easier for folks on Congress, our friends in Congress, to support us when there are attacks on things like the RFS. I think it's important for this group to construct and engage with folks. There are some in the environmental community that do indeed understand and appreciate the environmental benefits of this fuel. And we ought to be working very closely with them to expand our reach and their understanding of what we do so that we can gain more advocates in the environmental community so they in turn can advocate on our behalf. A relatively small number of people are in this business. I mean, when you think about the fact that less than one-tenth of one percent of America produces 85 percent of what we grow and raise, and you all are a subset of that one-tenth of one percent, you have to have more people talking on your behalf. There just simply aren't enough of us. Let's strategically align with some of these environmental groups. Have them help us so we can help them. We all are faced with a challenge with a changing climate, and we're all going to have to make the adaptation and, and mitigation uh, steps to, to, to uh, deal with these more intense storms that we're facing. Now is a great opportunity to develop a better relationship and a better level of communication between folks who may not have thought they have common ground but now do, because you all have created that common ground. And that strategic alliance doesn't just involve national groups, it involves each of your state and local uh, groups. You all are job creators. You all are stimulating the economy in your lo local community and in your state. You've got chambers of Congress, you have economic development folks who, who you need to know and they need to know you. And, and you have suppliers and people who are doing business with you who are benefited from your industry, who need to be engaged in making sure that the member of Congress who represents them the senators who represent them understand and appreciate the importance of this industry in their lives, in their community, in their state. And they need to be engaged and encouraged to communicate that. They, I was a former governor and as a former state senator, and even as a former small town mayor, I understand the power of constituent outreach. Trust me, if staff members in a senator's office or a representative's office begin to hear from folks that they wouldn't expect to hear from, a chamber of commerce executive, an economic development a county director, a supplier, or even a labor guy, saying, you know, this industry is important because my members are basically shipping it all over the world. My members' jobs are connected to this product. We really don't want it to go away. We don't want it to be diminished. It can make a difference. And the same is true for state and local governments. If mayors, city councils, state representatives are involved in passing resolutions that support the industry and they send those resolutions to congressional offices and senate offices, it can make a difference when that person is asked, how do you feel about the RFS, what should be done to the RFS? Third thing is we need a proactive message. That ad is an example of a proactive message about the greatness and the significance and the importance of what you all are doing. And Bob Benin and, and, and many of the folks with the RF I do a terrific job of responding and reacting. But we need to amplify. We need to talk about those jobs that are being created, those families that are being supported. We, want to, we need to talk about the pride of putting America in a position where it's no longer as reliant on foreign oil as it once was. We ought to be expressing the fact that we're really pleased that a consumer is saving money and, and they're able to use that money for some other purpose to take care of their family because they're not paying as much as the pump, at the pump 
uh, than they otherwise would. A proactive message and a proactive message that generates enthusiasm among young people. There are folks on land grant universities who want to be you, who want to be farmers and entrepreneurs and innovators, who want to be the engineers that help your facilities become more efficient. Engage them in this in, in this in this challenge. Engage them in using the social media to get your message out. You may not have as much money as the petroleum industry. You may not have all the slick. Uh, consultants that they may have, but you have an army of young people who understand the social media, who can blanket that media with a message that overcomes the paid media. You've got kids in FFA and 4-H who understand the importance of this industry. Use them. Inspire them. And finally, we need to make sure that the advancements that are taking place actually get in the market. It's time that we make a concerted effort to get the advanced biofuels into the market because that will also mute some of the criticism. That, that, that will raise some of the skepticism about whether or not there is indeed a, a, a extensive future for this industry using non-food feedstocks. This is so important. This is so important because I believe you all have opened up an awareness on the part of folks like me that rural America can drive a different, changed American economy. Less reliant on foreign sources, more innovative, more creative. I mean, the notion of being able to take a corn cob and producing a plastic bottle that is sold by a soft drink company all over the world that's 100% recyclable, 100% biodegradable, 100% renewable. The idea of being able to take a product like wood scraps and produce it into a vest that will be lighter and allow a police officer or a soldier to move a little bit more quickly when they're in the line of fire, saving their life, your industry is starting those kinds of developments. The ability to create from plant material every chemical, every fabric, every fiber, every plastic that we need in a society and then to be able to export those technologies around the world and be able to do it without sacrificing the capacity of this great country to produce enough to feed itself and export to other countries and to export that technology so that we can meet the moral challenges of, of, of our time of protecting the environment against the changing climate and of providing enough food for 9 billion, 10 billion, whatever it ultimately becomes of people who live in this earth. You guys are so important. And your mission is so important. And your capacity is unlimited. Yes, the times are tough. And yes, it's hard to pencil it out. But you gotta keep at it. You gotta keep fighting on it. Because you're winning. It may not seem like it, but you are. So with that, let me thank you uh, for this opportunity to be with you this morning. And let me strongly encourage you to understand the power of this industry, uh, the inspirational power of this industry, uh, to literally change a country. It's that big. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, thank you very, very much. The President of the United States, of course, is a strong partner, he always has been, uh, but having your passion, your expertise uh, within the cabinet is uh, a comfort to all of us in this room. We need leaders like President Obama, and we need leaders like you as well, uh, continuing to carry the message. 
The Secretary does have a couple minutes to take some questions, if there are any. Uh, just make your way to uh, the microphone. John? Good morning, Mr. Secretary. John Copper. I'm the Executive Director of the National Conduct and Research Center. Um, I just want your thoughts on the importance of mandatory funding under the energy title of uh, hopefully a new farm bill we'll get this year. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the question. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the farm bill generally and, and respond to your question. Uh, first of all, I think it's extremely important that we have a strong energy title in the farm bill. Uh, and I think that it's important that that strong energy title understand and appreciate what you all have unleashed, which is this whole bio-based economy opportunity, and that there is more flexibility in that, uh, in that title to provide help and assistance to those companies that are being, that are sort of offshoots of the technology that you all work on, so that we broaden the base. Uh, and and we're, we are really committed to this. We're really committed to it because if you're going to rebuild the rural economy, there are four cornerstones to it, and each of these cornerstones has to be supported in any kind of legislation that's passed. First, you obviously have production agriculture and its capacity not only to produce for ourselves, but to export. I mean, I'm proud of the fact that we've had the four best export years in the history of the United States. While I've been secretary, and we're expecting a record here this year. We want to keep that up, so there has to be a strong trade title, there has to be strong support for production agriculture, there has to be an appropriate safety net. Secondly, we have got to encourage conservation, and we have to link that conservation to outdoor recreation. Uh, outdoor recreation is a $656 billion industry, and we don't do as good a job as we should in connecting what we do in conservation, expanding habitat, improving landscapes, and bringing people from cities and suburbs to take advantage of what it is we're creating in terms of hunting or fishing, or biking or hiking opportunities. I think the President's designation uh, is designated from Secretary of Interior, uh, who is essentially right now the CEO of REI, is an indication of how important the President puts on that linking. So conservation, outdoor recreation. Third is local regional food systems. Not everybody can play at the, at the big table. Uh, so if you can create local markets and, and regional markets, it creates that, gives that smaller operator a chance to, to, to play as well. And we want that because we want people to feel free to be able to farm and encourage uh, producers of all sizes. And I'm proud of the fact that we've seen not just a record number of acres of rural conservation in this administration, but also record expansion of local and regional food systems. And then finally, the bio-based economy. All that has to be in the farm. Now, we're facing a challenge. And the challenge is, first and foremost, the budget. You know, in the next couple of weeks, Congress has a pretty important decision to make whether or not they're going to trigger what is called sequester. And what that is, is essentially, if they fail to act, then automatically on March 1st, what goes into effect is an across-the-board cut for virtually every agency, every line item of every agency. The effects will be extraordinary. I'll just give you one effect. It is likely, if sequester is triggered, that in our food safety area, we will have to furlough workers for a period of a couple of weeks. Now you say, well, you know, everybody gets a couple of weeks vacation. The problem is, as soon as you take an inspector off the floor, that plant shuts down. So it's not just the inspectors, it's the hundreds of thousands of people who are in the processing business. Those plants shut down, and what impact and effect is that going to have on the markets? It's a billion, billions and billions of dollars of impact on the markets. What happens when supply gets shorted because we aren't processing? Prices go up for consumers. That's one tiny, tiny uh, implication or, or consequence of this question. Now, you take that across the entire federal government. It's a terrible way to do business. Sequester could have an impact on the farm bill. Because in order to avoid sequester, some, some folks may say, well, you know what, Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're, we're to do some deficit reduction. We're going to take some money from those farm programs, and we'll use it for deficit reduction now, not in the context of a new farm bill, but just to avoid sequester. Well, when they do that, it makes it more difficult to write that farm bill. Because if you're going to do away with direct payments, you're going to try to save the $48 million that direct payments represents, and you're going to try to plow some of that back into a new system, 
that takes care of rice producers and cotton producers and soybean producers and corn producers and wheat producers, etc. But yet you also have to have some for deficit reduction. The smaller that pie is, the more difficult it is to write those programs. And then if you can't solve the dairy issue, but the Speaker of the House has some concerns about supply side management, then all of a sudden you get stuck, nothing happens, they continue the programs, but as they do, the risk of that direct payment money going away for some of the purpose increases. So it's a dicey time. It's a very dicey time. And it's just been really hard to manage the departments because you, we don't have a budget for 2013. We don't have a, we don't know whether we're going to be faced with this cut. And if we get a cut, we have to institute it in six months, the remaining six months of the fiscal year. So, so whatever the percentage is, let's say it's a 5% cut, it actually is the effect of a 10% cut because it's 5% over the course of the entire year, but you only got a half a year to institute it. It's a 10% cut. And we've already had our budget cut by 12.5%. So in, in an area where you're so heavily dependent on people, there's just only so much you can do. We've already saved over $100 million in USDA by cutting travel conferences, uh, strategic sourcing. We have a very aggressive and very comprehensive effort to try to become more efficient. But it takes time to create those efficiencies. So strong energy title, but there are serious challenges to getting the bill through. That's why I, I've been talking about the political relevance of rural America and the importance of creating strategic alliances, of constructively, constructively engaging with people who don't necessarily agree with us, so that we broaden our base, so that we get more political support to either stop things like eliminating the RFS or promote things like a farm bill that has a strong energy. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Greg Krissig, ICM College, Kansas. Thank you for your advocacy and support on our behalf, especially with your counterparts at um, EPA. And I wonder, you know, as they have more and more impact on our industry, especially as the priority you mentioned of advanced biofuels, even such as for my corn fiber, could you give us a little perspective on what the EPA of the next several years looks like? compared to what we've experienced, both positive and sometimes challenging over the last couple of years. Well, man, I'm having a hard enough time running my own place. Uh, <laughs> but let me, let me say a couple of things. First of all, uh, when Lisa Jackson left, she, someone asked her, one of the reporters asked her if there was anything she regretted. And, you know, that's a, when you're in a position of authority for, as, as white hot as that place is for four years, I, I imagine you, that, that question really probably makes you pause and think. But, but her answer was interesting and I think insightful. She said, you know, the one thing I regret is that, that and I'm paraphrasing what she said, is that I, I, when I went into this job, I didn't have quite the understanding about rural America that I needed to have. And, you know, that says a lot about her as a person. Because I, we, we went over to EPA, I went over to EPA, and I said, you know, you got to get to know these people. You need to travel out there, you need to visit the farmers, you need to have regular meetings with people so that you understand how they're interpreting, how they're hearing what it is that you all are attempting to do here and, and understanding that you're attempting to do something because Congress has told you you have to do it or because some judge has, has, has forced you to do it. And to her credit, she did that, and I think as she did, she began to realize, you know, how hard it is. Um, now, I think the fact that she expressed that is helpful in terms of whoever the next EPA administrator is. Because I can tell you that one thing I will do is when that person is announced, I will call or, or, or write or, or sit down with that person very early in the process and say, look, we had a great relationship with Lisa Jackson. You know, we had the ability to communicate with friends. Uh, we try to work through problems, we try to mitigate situations that were touchy for both the uh, EPA and USDA. We'd like to continue that, uh, that relationship and we'd like to point out that Lisa really wishes that she had to do it over again, that she had a better understanding of rural America. Really strongly encourage you to learn from that piece of advice. I don't know who the, EPA, who the new EPA administrator is going to be. There's, uh, you know, Washington DC's got a lot of rumors. Uh, but I'm confident that whoever that person is, we will develop a very strong, very strong relationship and a very strong partnership. Uh, 
because I understand how important it is to all of you, and, and I, I understand how important it is for, for the environment to get it right. Um, and I would imagine that, uh, based on my understanding of questions that have been asked of people who might be thinking about this, the, 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 there has been a question of, you know, what do you, what do you think about ethanol? Do you support ethanol? So I think in, within EPA, there's a, a slightly different attitude about ethanol than there was four years ago. And I think it's a much more positive attitude. Um, and I think Lisa, uh, Lisa's leadership had a lot to do with that. Well, again, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much uh, for being here. You have been a tremendous leader. We appreciate everything that you do. And we are at your side to help you in any way we can. This industry has been built uh, with great leadership. And every year we do try to recognize that leadership and recognize people that uh, have contributed to the success of our industry. The most difficult thing in the world, I think, is being first at anything. Think of the courage it must have taken for that first person to have hit Omaha Beach. More bravery than can be imagined. And in some of the fights that uh, we have coming up, indeed, uh, people have seen just that kind of, uh, of a battle. Many of you know that uh, Scott Zaremba was the first person this year to offer E15 uh, to consumers with 2001 new vehicles. Now, Scott has been in the limelight as a pioneer in this industry for some time because he has blender pumps at all his facilities. He had offered E85 very early on. He offers uh, all blends at all his stations, E15, a mid-level blend, E85, E10. He offers it all. Uh, and he has uh, done so uh, taking the slings and arrows from his competitors, his supplier, uh, who haven't been as enthusiastic about promoting American agriculture and 